Welcome to the Penny Forward podcast. Penny Forward is a community of people who are blind, their families, and friends who share an interest in financial independence. Visit pennyforward.com to learn more about who we are and what we do. Join us now as we get to know people like us who are working towards their own success. Here's your host, Chris Peterson. My guest today is Tommaso Nonis. He is a translator. He knows multiple languages and has worked in the European Parliament and is now working as a technical translator, translating JAWS from English to Italian. Tommaso, thanks for being here. You're welcome. It's a pleasure for me to be here as well. Well, I was excited to meet you last week on Clubhouse, and I'm really excited to share your story. So let's jump right into it. Tell me about yourself. So I am a mixture between a localization and language hobbyist and professional and a technology hobbyist. And all my life, I've uh, looked into combining these two passions together into something that would make my job as cool as possible and something that I would be really loving to be doing. And that's what I am achieving so far. I think the fact that I've uh, gone abroad and done stuff and uh, moved a lot has uh, really opened my world up and my views of it as well, enabling me to be as productive as I now think I am, even though there's no end to the to, to what a person can achieve, actually. So let's go way back. Tell me about how you got started. Around high school, I've always been passionate about both learning languages and technology. But I would say it was my parents' like uh, push to drive me to go towards languages because I was not that great an achiever at math, I would say. But I still wanted to have technology play a vital role into what would be my job. So I went for a language career and I studied English, uh, Spanish and Portuguese. And I attended interpreting and translation school and I graduated into simultaneous conference interpreting. So people who are interpreting generally sit in a booth and they simultaneously translate vocally what the original speaker is saying. I completed my studies and was offered an internship at the European Parliament. And that's when I realized that I could do something that also included technology and programming. And so I started learning JAWS scripting and other kinds of programming on my own and knew that would be a part of my job sometime. And the the opportunity arose because a little company in Luxembourg, where I was doing the internship at the European Parliament, was looking for somebody who had experience in translation software. And I told them about accessibility and blindness-specific issues, and they seemed to be interested. So I got enrolled in this six-month internship to try to improve the accessibility of this platform for blind and visually impaired individuals. This did not go as expected, but still it allowed me to dig deeper into the technology and programming aspect, which by that time I had, let's say, a little bit left behind. And so I worked three years in a company that was uh, into digital marketing. And so I translated software which related to digital marketing and the marketing automation and uh, newsletters and all of that. That also gave me a great boost into my tech skills because I had to translate programming guides and other stuff. So I learned as I went. I learned as I translated Until one day when I called the Italian dealer for Freedom Scientific, which is the, for those who don't know, is the main brand that produces technology for blind people in the world. I had detected by the time some um, errors in the translation of that program into Italian. And so I volunteered to do some fixing of that to make the Italian version of the program more appealing to Italian customers. Uh, He wasn't able to give me a salary upfront, 
but he told me we could be collaborating for a certain amount of money per month. And so two years and a half after of this, I actually was offered a contract and now I am the official localizer for the Italian market uh, of Freedom Scientific. And also I do activities such as scripting, small programs and uh, product demos. And so I think it's a perfect job that combines these two passions into one, basically in an environment where I can really, really thrive, I think. We'll continue our interview in a moment, but first... Boy, it's a beautiful day outside. I think I'll mow my lawn. Boy, when I finish with this yard, I really gotta get working on some more podcasts. Gotta remove some silences, gotta take out some ums, gotta remove that annoying whistling sound in the background. Uh, uh oh. Superblink.org. We're really great at cutting audio, but maybe you should cut your own grass. Do you have a short success story you want to share on the air? Leave us a message at 952-856-0313. If you miss that number, you can always find us at pennyforward.com slash podcast. I'm curious to learn more about your time at the European Parliament. I've seen some coverage of the United Nations where where people are translating in the in the booths like you were describing. And I would like to know what that's like and how software fits into that. So uh, at the European Parliament, uh, as a matter of fact, I was not translating in the booth. I was just translating written documents. And uh, one of the great issues, which is still unresolved by this day, is that the accessibility of software for translators, such as um, those that translators use to speed up their work, is really a barrier for people who are blind because it's built upon custom technologies and custom interfaces which are undigestible by the, the software that we use to use computers, basically. So I've always had to find workarounds and alternative solutions to pretty much everything I had to do. And uh, you get to translate a lot of documents there from legal to technical to parliamentary interrogations. There are a variety of documents that you get to translate. But the idea is that it really props your translation skills up. It really prepares you for the job markets, but it does so in an international environment. So what I really got to enjoy was meeting people from all over Europe, really. I made friends from the UK, Ireland, Germany, Austria, France, uh, anywhere, the Netherlands and and so on and so forth. And so it was really an eye-opening year for me because the first time I was really living abroad for myself and also for my family, it was really something that they were a little scared uh, about, but we we managed. I hope I've answered your, your question to the best of my knowledge. Well, yeah, I, I learned a lot because I had not thought of the document aspect of, of something like a, a parliament or, or anything. I imagine you learned a lot of vocabulary by doing that. Yeah, but the vocabulary I learned was very, very specific. I mean, it's not something that you use outside of that. Sure. Uh, because most uh, of the vocabulary you learn is about internal procedures, internal roles within the European Parliament, types of uh, meetings that are held there, type of uh, climate agreements and whatnot, you know, things that are very, very specific to that industry. But what it really teaches you is not the vocabulary itself, but how to search for things, how to learn new stuff. Because as a translator, you get to uh, translate a wide array of uh, topics. And even though a golden rule in this industry is to specialize in one or two key areas. You never going to be thrown at you. So you've got to be prepared and know how to search for the terminology that you need. Well, that's really, really interesting and really important, I think, in, in just about any career. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about studying abroad. I would think that that would be very intimidating as a blind person 
Yeah, it depends a lot on the family. As a language student, I've always wanted to do that. And my family was very, very, very supportive. I mean, one thing that you must have clear is the the independent living skills need to be there. And one thing that I literally crushed against is that at the time, for example, my mobility skills, I wouldn't say non-existent, but very close to that. And I had to really, really, really focus on mastering that to be able to succeed. To tell you the truth, I was already studying far away from my hometown. There's no university there. Uh, I had been doing that for two years. But jumping abroad was something that was really, really, really different. I was really on my own there. The advice I would give to somebody is to be prepared and to do extensive research on the organizations for blind people that there are, the the support that you will get there, the training that you will get there. So try to buy yourself as much time as possible to search for all this information because it's it's going to be vital if you want to the intimidation to to fade away to succeed. You know, a lot of us rely on asking people for help on the street. Say you know, looking for directions to something. Is yeah, is that sure. difficult when you're traveling abroad and maybe you're, you're not a native speaker of the language? It is. So um, to tell you the truth, I had two experiences abroad. I did nine months in Spain and uh, then I had the year in Luxembourg. And they were quite different because in Spain, I knew the language. I knew it quite well. So that was not a problem. But in Luxembourg, although people speak English and French, which were the two languages I was most using, a lot of native speakers speak something called Luxembourgish, which is, it's a language, but it's more considered a dialect. And uh, really only the people there know it. Uh, a lot of expats don't even bother to to learn the language because it's, especially in the city center, it's uh, everyone gets by with French and English. But in my case, I was living really far away. And uh, many times I got into situations where I wasn't understood at all. And that boy was frightening. You need to be patient. If someone doesn't understand you, you have to keep asking and somebody will eventually come to the rescue. But yeah, there have been situations where that were really scary. Talk to me more about how you turned your internship into an actual career. Uh, what was it like going from that internship to that first job that you, you talked about a little bit at the beginning? Well, um, it was quite a tense moment, okay, because uh, during the internship, I was offered a very well-paid job in the Netherlands, but I had family issues. Uh, My parents were not well at the time, health-wise, and so uh, the situation was really serious, and I I wasn't feeling comfortable being away while my parents were really, really, really risking. And so I had to give that up and I stayed six months unemployed. And, uh, but the fact that I earned so much experience from that internship allowed me to go to some job seeking portals, for example, Indeed, and get an interview in approximately four months of constant job hunting. And then I was able to pick up my first job from there. So in uh, back home, basically. But it was that which allowed me then to to meet the guy who would be my employer, my employer now. Did you go to a lot of other interviews? I had three in total because uh, no other company had responded because, you know, I first opted for the strategy of... uh, disclosing blindness at first and that might have thrown off a lot of companies i don't know i suspect i can only make speculations here you know we'll continue our interview in a moment but first have you noticed that at some stores there's always a sale going on this is a lesson that i've taught my kids over the years When we're watching TV or listening to the radio, there are some stores who are always advertising a sale. They do this to get your attention because they want you to come in and buy things. And it's great if you need something that happens to be on sale. The problem is, is that sometimes you can buy things that you don't need just because they're on sale. 
So next time you hear about a sale going on, think hard about whether you need to buy something because it's always going to be possible to find it at a good price. Do you have a tip or trick you've discovered that makes managing your finances easier? Tell us about it at 952-856-0313. If you missed that number, you can always find us at pennyforward.com slash podcast. Tell me more detail about the job search. You you spent four months, you said. And you yeah. looked on Indeed. Out of that, you had three interviews. Mm -hmm. Um do you have a guess for how many jobs you applied for and and what was it like just doing that job search? Oh, it was really, really, really frustrating because when you go from being employed and going every day to your job, being active, you go from that to being stuck at home, basically. It was a lockdown period for me, actually, because that's what it was in terms of, uh, in today's term, we would call it lockdown. So I was really searching, 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 because I knew that the sooner I found something, the sooner I would be able to lead an active life again. And also the, the a major impact uh, obviously was played by the fact that I had to give up this opportunity that was thrown at me. So it was a difficult time, but you need to first and foremost have someone really, really, really go through your CV. And I say that knowing that someone might say, why do I need somebody to do that? Well, because no, no matter how well your formatting skills are and uh, and stuff it's always good if you have someone who can really tell you how it would look to a sighted person and that's your first business card your first ticket that you present to people so that's a, a fantastic head start and then what really 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 made a difference was that i tailored my cvs and my cover letters to what I was searching for. So I was really able to tailor that to the job search. And uh, at first it was really, really, really demoralizing not having anybody respond, especially in the freelance market because I was also investigating that. But then eventually someone will answer. That's my pledge to people. During that time, was there any sort of income at all? Were you making any money? Or getting money from any any services, or or was I was uh, earning what you guys call in the U.S. SSI or SSDI? I didn't know the difference between the two, but the the Italian equivalent of that I was earning. Okay, so you had some help, and yeah. was that true also when you were in school? Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. And also in it in Italy, one of the lucky things that we have is that that's also untouched when you work. So if you work, you still have that. And about how much do you get from that? Uh, seven, eight hundred euros. And is that a lot or a little? No. I don't think people know. It's enough to afford a decent apartment, but with nothing left. You cannot even, if you pay your rent, a month's rent, let's say, you cannot buy food with that alone. Okay. I think that's pretty similar to what life is like in the States. Yeah. Are, are there apartments for people that are on lower incomes that... Uh, you can take advantage of or, or, or any, how yeah. do you get by with that? Yeah, but uh, I've really not ever investigate that because when I was in such a time, I was always with my parents living with my parents. So that's something I'm not able to really give you a good answer to. Sure. So you said that you still continue to receive that once you're working. Is there anything yeah. that would cause you to lose it? Or is that always, is that universal? I was reflecting on losing it when I was going to go abroad because six months abroad and you lose it, which might not even be a concern for some people who are not looking to go abroad. But for me, it was. And so the answer is, as long as you stay in the country, you get that. Okay, so it's unique to Italy then and, and yeah. different European countries will have or may not different. have different programs. Yeah, some some have uh, even more, and some don't have anything at all. I know, for example, the UK has something, but you need to prove that you're not able to carry out certain tasks on your own, which I don't think it's a good thing because it 
encourages people not to be independent, not to do things, not to because that money might still be necessary, even though you know how to do stuff, because there, there, there will be always places for which you need to take a cab, for example. And not having that really hurts. And um, there are countries that give you that as long as you are not able and prove that you're not able to carry out tasks on your own. There is uh, a big debate in at least in the US about things like this and and one of the feelings is is that hey if you give people this money they won't feel a desire to to work clearly that wasn't the case with you have you ever felt that way that you you know you just figure I'm I'm going to stay at home and I, I don't really need to do anything I'm not that kind of person it's really out of me I it just I felt so desperate for one day out of work imagine how I would feel not working it's just my will to give something to society and be recognized for it. It's just too strong for you to even, it didn't even cross my mind, you know? Do you think that having that source of income has been helpful to you in getting to where you are now? Do you think you would have yes. been able to do it if you had not had? had this, I this? would, but I wouldn't be affording an apartment here very close to work which allows me to basically go on foot to work every day now which is quite an interesting thing in this period of pandemic and working from home which i'm not i'm not working from home uh, i consider myself very lucky to have had this and this allows me to not work from home at least not the whole week i work from home one or two days a week but i live very close to where i work and this allows me to you know get dressed and in 10 minutes be in the workplace which i would have not allowed myself if i had not had this uh income alongside the salary so you talked about a lockdown period earlier yeah. and you were talking about your unemployment but in europe the idea of lockdowns was a real thing, especially at the beginning of, of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And uh, Italy was was a place that we saw a lot of stuff about in the news here, that the lockdowns sure. were very, very, very strict. So tell me about what it was like to be working and, and just living as a blind person through that lockdown. It was tough. Also, because I had been working from home prior to that for a year, because there was a particular point where I had to go to the office and I couldn't because there was a uh, very, very, very large, like a uh, three or four lane intersection with no traffic light or anything that would allow me to cross safely. So I was pretty much dependent on people either being there when I had to cross or taking taxis. And that was a huge hit on my financials. So I requested working from home already in 2019. So when this struck, I was already working from home for a year, a full year. Okay. And when I was in lockdown, the novelty of that had faded off way, way earlier for me. And I had to go back to my parents at that point. I really felt like I, I was back at the starting square. Okay. And it was really, really tough. I had some company because I had my parents there, obviously. Uh, we were in a big house, but the dream of, you know, being alone, living by myself, doing all my things, uh, as a 30-year-old would do, having that cut off of me, that was really, really, really intense. And uh, now we are in a second lockdown. We, we cannot leave the house, but I have earned the skills that I need to be there even on my own so I can live my life even though we are in a second total lockdown. Not as harsh as the first, but it's still a lockdown. Tell me what a total lockdown involves. I, I gather that at, at one point you weren't even able to leave to, to go get groceries. Only one person in the family was allowed to. And they had to have a written document stating when you left, when you planned to return home, and if the police stopped you, you had to show that. And were some of the transportation options that you, you would normally depend on uh, available during 
during that time or during this one? They were, and they still are. But at least at the time, if you didn't have a valid reason by your employer saying that this person cannot work from the office, you had to be working from home. Okay. But there were ways for you to, to go out and buy food. Yes, items. only that was allowed. Even like walking around the house was not permitted as, uh, during the very first lockdown. Then they lifted that. But there were people like in the gardens, like taking photos of bypassers that would just go for a walk and showing that to police. That was really atrocious. Like the escape goat, you know? Wow, that's a little scary. I don't think that those of us in the United States, we never had anything quite that serious. I don't think we can imagine it. What did that do to the European economy, do you think? It created masses of unemployment, masses of closures, masses of despair. More so than the economy, like young people are now really suffering because we are in a second round of this mess. And... Uh, People have not been going to school for a full year now. And it, it, this really worries me. And I, I would not have wanted to, to be a blind person in those uh, going to school at that time because everybody was like uh, do, doing school through the internet. But who knows what a blind person would have had if everything would have been accessible. And also, you know, a lot of blind people have loneliness problems normally. Imagine now. I mean, it's something that I don't even dare think about. So I, I'm, I consider myself lucky to be the age I am in this challenging times. So you were saying that in the US, it, it was not so strict. It was not so strict. There were a lot of people that were classified as what we called essential workers that were still going to work, but uh, there were still a lot of people that were were being encouraged to work from home, and and I was I was fortunate enough to be able to to work from home, and I, and I still am, but uh, they weren't keeping people from going for walks or things like that, and uh, of course the consequences of that is that the U.S. has you know, had some pretty severe outbreaks of COVID. You know, I, I think the mm. the uh, the rest of the world has has had some pretty serious outbreaks too. But uh, we, you know, we fall towards the bottom of of uh, the the response. <clears throat> yeah, I, I imagine that other countries were like staring at us in dismay when we had we were the first to be hit so hard by by COVID nineteen. Uh, it certainly was something that made the news pretty prominently, I, I recall. So were you ever worried for your job or, or your standard of living uh, during any of this? Yeah, because I was furloughed for half the day. So I would work only four hours and four hours I would have st state aid. But someone got fired, actually. So uh, I was like, is it going to be me next? Yeah, I certainly felt that. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment, but first. When it comes to money, do you feel a little lost? When you're in an unfamiliar financial environment and need a hand understanding the lay of the land, Penny Forward is here to help. We provide affordable one-on-one -on -one and group financial education programs that give you the confidence to get out there and achieve your goals. Visit pennyforward.com to learn more about who we are and what we do. Do you have a favorite budgeting, banking, or investing app? Tell us about it at 952-856-0313. If you miss that number, you can always find it at pennyforward.com forward slash podcast. So tell me, Tommaso, what do you think is next for you? How do you see yourself moving forward from from what you're doing now to whatever you plan to do next? Well, uh, certainly having something on my own, which involves technology and especially translation technology and accessibility is something that I've been investigating. But that requires really a lot of effort, but it's something that I am really, really, really going to investigate 
and try to put to fruition. But of course, I'm really enjoying for now the job that I'm having because I, you know, I've started this January, so it's quite new for me. It's not even two months, but I would really want to focus my energy on uh, on uh, thriving in language and uh, and technology. How have other people played a role in your success? <clears throat> Oh, I've had a lot of help and especially for from other blind people who were successful and uh, always encouraged me not to give up, not to fall into stereotype blindness related jobs, because you have to know that here in Italy, uh, blind people, there are two or three jobs that they do, almost all of them do. And uh, I've uh, always follow the advice of those who've tried to tell me to aim for my own dreams and uh, try to make them come true. And that's was, that was really encouraging to see, you know, other blind people having reached these kinds of goals. And uh, yeah, this is the answer I would give you. You've given a lot of advice to people throughout our talk, but if you had to distill that down into just a minute or two, what would you want to say to other blind people that might not be as far along as you uh, about how to, how to keep going? You know, uh, first, mm, I would want to be somewhat provocative, even though I'm not going to be liked by somebody. So really work hard, really get out there, try to make yourself to own your social skills, your relationship skills, and your manners, your ways of being with other people, because that's going to be fundamental. And above all, uh, apart from the usual, you know, uh, try to fine tune your skills and everything like that, do not do not let yourself be engulfed into the blindness only bubble. So be with other blind people, learn from them, teach them what you need, but also present yourself to the big world outside because that's going to be where your opportunities come from. Wow. That's, that's really quite profound. Tommaso, I want to thank you for being here today. It's been really enjoyable. And uh, is there anything you want to tell people before we leave oh well uh i i really hope that i can be of some um, significance to to people who might not be as far along as i am but also i would love to learn from people who have gotten much further along because that's also absolutely possible that it can have happened and uh, I would really like to thank Clubhouse for giving us the opportunity to meet and I think that that's for job seeking especially for networking purposes that's something that blind people should really keep an eye on because the audio format of it and the number of people that there are means that there is quite some opportunity there what don't you think? I definitely think so. Yes. Uh, we, we met on Clubhouse and I've had a ton of other uh, encounters with people that are probably going to end up on this podcast at some point because there's there's just so many great stories to tell. And thanks for sharing yours, Tommaso. Uh, thanks for being here. My pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the Penny Forward podcast. Penny Forward is a community of people who are blind, their families, and friends who share an interest in financial independence. Visit pennyforward.com to learn more about who we are and what we do. Until next time, from all of us in the Penny Forward community, thanks for listening.